It's okay. You yeah. are. I'll talk to you. Thanks for coming. That's very nice of you. Evaluation subcommittee chair and soon to be uh, assessment and student learning outcomes chair, I suspect. And yes, I think that's happening. I think that's going to happen. I think that's going to happen soon. And I'm Eva Bag, um, associate dean of institutional effectiveness. And we have gotten together to um, give you present some information on survey developments because this is a very effective assessment tool and we're now going into this whole outcomes assessment process. So we thought that this might be a good workshop. And I'm so pleased to see so many people from all different walks of the college coming to this. So, so thank you all very much. And as we go through the PowerPoint and the handouts, please, if you have any questions, if you need clarification, if I, if I tend to go too much on the instructional side or she goes too much on the service side and you need some clarifying questions, don't hesitate because we're here to help everybody and, I'll, and get you thinking about how to develop a survey effectively. All righty? Okay, let's get going. Okay. All right. First, um, we need to talk about generally, basically, what is a survey. You have the information up there. Basically, it's a process of trying to get information, um, typically more about attitudes um, and perceptions that people have uh, about either learning or a service, and that's what you're trying to ascertain. Um, you can do a sampling of the, the information. You can survey everybody. Something, and we're going to get into more of those details. But that's what you're really trying to find out. Um, the next slide is out of order in your handout. So if you look at your handout, it's the top of the second page right here. So let's see how much you're paying attention right away. Um, I'm going to start off. OK, that's what surveying is. And the first thing you have to think about is, is a survey really the best thing for the information you want to find? So just to do a survey just to survey is not the right reason to create a survey, <laughs> for lack of a better way to explain it. You must have a distinct and practical purpose for doing a survey. And if you can't figure that out right up front, then surveying is not for you. So you really have to know exactly what you're trying to find out. And then maybe a survey will, will, will be your choice. Kim, can I stop you real quick? You can. Show we, uh, we, do. we always okay. do this. Okay. Can I just get a show of hands? Who is here at this workshop because you're thinking of developing a survey to assess a service for a student learning outcome? So that's very practical, and, and then we can kind of be mindful of that, that you're trying to hone in on that okay, particular so purpose. I'm just curious. Okay, Thank you. Does that make sense? Now, the next uh, bullet item in here, we need to see if it's practical or not for you. You need to think, is it practical for me to actually <coughs> make a survey and actually distribute a survey and be able to collect the survey? And do we have the time and the resources to tally the survey and all of that? So these are the things. We want you to think about these items up front before you even get started with developing a survey. Because this can then either start you or stop you right off the bat before you put in too much time or effort. So that's, these are some considerations you need to think about. And here we talk about survey fatigue, bureaucratic fatigue, assessment fatigue, audience fatigue. If you, if you, if I'm thinking students, and if every student who goes into every class, every program is given a survey, they're going to get tired of taking surveys, right? And you're going to get tired of tallying surveys, and we're not going to have the resources. So you have to be judicious about how we do this. So surveys are great for like at the program level, but you, and so there are a lot of dis disciplines within a program, and if every discipline did their own survey, maybe it's better to just put everything in one survey and get them in one shot. So these are the things you need to consider when you're planning for a survey. Low quality. Um, we just don't want to throw a survey out there because we now have to do outcomes assessment and you know that a survey is one way you can assess and so you just make some funky little survey and just throw it out there. And so you have to commit to making a good quality survey that is going to give you the information that you are looking for. And if you're not able to commit the personnel, the resources, and the time for this, maybe surveying isn't the right approach at this particular time for you. Maybe later. Okay? But these are some things to think about. Indirect versus direct assessment issue. A survey is 
an indirect assessment. You are not directly, numerically assessing student learning or the actual service. You are surveying somebody's opinion, somebody's perceptions, which are very valid and can provide very helpful information for all of you. But it is not a direct assessment measure. And for most of our outcomes assessment process, most, for SLOs and SUOs, we are looking for direct assessment measures. You have to have direct assessment measures. Then beyond that, if you want to throw in a couple of indirect assessment measures to get more of that quantitative um, opinions and, and things like that, that is absolutely acceptable. But do not misconstrue that, well, I did a survey, I did my outcomes assessment. A survey by itself is not appropriate. That by itself is not appropriate for outcomes assessment. As part of multiple measures, absolutely. Okay, so doing other kinds of assessments, this can help inform and enrich the information you're getting for the outcomes assessment process. Does that make sense to everybody? Y'all with me? Okay, good, yeah? Okay. One-shot assessments are less valuable than continuous assessments. So once you develop a survey, once you tweak it, you get it the way you want to do. Just doing a survey one time to give you a little snapshot is nice, but you really want to think about committing to a more continuous process, like maybe at the end of every year, end of every semester. Um, right, and this is what we're looking for in order to improve, right? Remember, we keep talking about assessment. The ultimate goal is to improve our programs. So you're really through the use of a survey, for example. It's an indirect measure to assess ongoing improvement over time. So then you would administer the same survey over time. You're, 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 you're trending, you're monitoring to see the changes. So recognize that, that that's something that would have to be done. So if any of these are problems, if any issues arise, don't do a survey. <laughs> there are other assessment tools that you can be used and maybe this isn't the right avenue for you at this time. So you, you need to think about things ahead of time before we actually start to develop a survey. All righty, very good. Okay, next. Now, you think you're ready to start a survey. You're still not ready to actually start a survey because once you get past that, now we're going back to the bottom of the first page again. See, thought I'd flip you back and forth a little bit. Just make sure you're paying attention. The very first thing you really have to do is preliminary planning is to understand what is the purpose of your survey. You must answer that question for yourself. What is the purpose of your survey? And here are some bullet items for you to consider when you're doing this pre-planning before you even actually physically develop a survey. And the first one is you are confronted with a need for information. There are questions that need to be answered about your service about your instructional program, about something, and you want to find out uh, information for this. And so you have to have this purpose. There needs to be that right off the bat. If there is, then you need to be specific and clear cut about the possible information you need. You need to focus yourself on some specific questions up front that you want to have answered. If you cannot do this at this stage, then maybe surveying isn't the right thing for you. Okay? But you're going to have to go through the thinking process. And this is not a one-person deal. This is very collaborative work at this stage. You need to be talking to people in your service units, in your work areas, in your instructional programs, and get some feedback at this, at this stage. And this is preliminary planning. Okay? Here again, I'm, I'm emphasizing this. Um, is surveying the best possible way to get the information you are seeking? So you have to answer these questions for yourself. Maybe, maybe not. If you don't know, then you need to go talk to somebody who does know who can help you with this. Because we don't want you to put in the time and the effort if you're sort of unclear. You want to be clear up front and then you can move on. We don't want people to go here and then backtrack and here and backtrack and get annoyed. We don't want annoyance or frustration at this point. You can write a few, you want to write as few as number of questions as possible to get the information you are seeking. That's one of the first rules of surveying, okay? So you really need to focus yourself on what it is you really want to know and learn from this protocol. And the last point here that you need to understand right up front, there are always trade-offs. No survey is perfect, and you're going to get trade-offs. 
it, you may have want all of this information, but the survey becomes 45 pages long. Nobody's going to take it. No, it's not. Does that make sense? You're always going to have to trade off what you want and what you can do realistically. Okay? And just know that up front. And if you can get through all this pre-planning, then you can actually start to develop a survey. So you can see that there's a lot of thinking that goes into this before you even start to create a survey. And the thinking saves you time in the long run. Okay? So, but you got to put in the time up front a little bit before. Kip, just um, tag teaming mm -hmm. again, just really in practical terms, what I would recommend then, at least for the administrative units, and Kim, you can speak to the faculty. You know, take a look at maybe your department, your office, pull together your service unit outcomes, your student learning outcomes, see if you can, if you've decided for an assessment task and part of your assessment plan that a survey is something that you think will work, see if you can answer or provide data for multiple service unit outcomes with one survey, for example. It's really cool if you can, I know with student support services, trying to get some of those areas to maybe come together and maybe you can have a division survey and actually that's something we're going to try and support you with to see if there's some um, opportunities to do that. But really, that's some of the assessment data. You've already put in a lot of thinking about your service unit outcomes, so we presume that that's important to you. You've attached them to some goals, that kind of thing. Um, but start, sit down with those, and then do as Kim has suggested. Just from your departmental perspective, what do we need to know? What are the questions? You don't need to bother with the language that you're going to deliver for the respondents yet. Just keep it as straightforward as possible. The rest of this presentation, or a good piece of it, is going to talk about the wording needs to be very different in the actual survey so that it's easy to understand. But initially, it's your thing. Again, as Kim has said, you want it to answer a specific set of questions. Minimize that. Really resist the temptation to collect data that is nice to know. Because again, that's where you're going to shift into that fatigue. You're going to be asking too many questions. Really, it's got to be focused on the data that you really need to inform progress against your service unit outcome or student <coughs> outcome. So just in a practical way, that would be a way to start. Keep it simple. You're going to hear this from us a lot over the years, <laughs> keeping things simple. Okay, that being done, now here are your steps in survey development. Trust me, there are a ton more than this. If you want to get into hardcore research and all of that, knock yourself out. We don't want to do this here. This is just outcomes assessment, okay? So we're trying to develop surveys to give you meaningful and helpful information for your key outcome questions. And that's it. It doesn't have to be fancy, it ha just has to be good. That, that's all. So we've broken it down into a five-step process. You've done your preliminary thinking and planning. Like we said, then step number one, who and how are you going to administer the survey to? Who do you want to give the survey to and how are you physically actually going to administer the survey? Um, is it going to be, and we'll go into more details by this, but this is your overview. Second step is what is the actual content and wording? Now this is when, like Eva was saying, you, you had some preliminary questions and trying to figure out, and this is where then you start to edit and really hone it down, is in step number two. Step number three, the structure of the responses. There's a bunch of different ways that you can lay out survey questions. We're going to go over the major format types with you, and you, this is a decision that you're going to have to make so that you can get the responses that are most helpful for you. That's the whole point of all of this. Then establish your sequence of your questions, your uh, the survey, and then the actual layout of the survey so that it looks professional because you're representing your program and the college and things like that. And so people tend to respond to surveys that look professional. Okay, does that make sense? Understand the okay? Let's drill down a little bit. Okay, step number one. Who and how will this survey be administered to? The first thing you can see is, I, I start right off the bat, is sample size. Because most people think they need to survey everybody. You don't need to survey everybody. You can just take a sample size, and that can provide you with enough at, uh, and good information to help you do your outcomes assessment process. So don't think you have to survey everybody that walks in the door. You can just do a sample size, and that's fine. 
and there's a now you can do the general population if you want to. I mean, knock yourself out if you want to. But if you have you know 500 people walking through the door in one semester, you may not want to go through 500 surveys. Okay, so that's why we're thinking sampling is good, and that's just a portion of the population you're interested in, and that's perfectly acceptable. There is um, a couple of different ways you can sample. Random sampling, right? You throw them all in a bucket and you pull out 25. That's okay. You can do that. That's perfectly acceptable. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Then there's also something called a representative sample, um, which is you intentionally look at maybe like LAC versus PCC, day students versus night students. Um, I don't know for the service area. Well, you might be interested in certain, certain ethnic groups. You might be interested in certain populations that you serve, like their special student services programs that you would only be focusing on those that you have an impact on with your program. So you're specifying the population, and it might be a subset already defined of the general student population. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier potentially maybe doing this as a divisional versus a departmental survey. So obviously if it's a divisional survey, it's assumed that you have, like the whole division has one sample size and one, I guess, group that they're trying to focus on. You know, Medhani, I would say in a case like that, where you're trying to get information across several departments, I, I'd say that bumps it up to a level where institutional effectiveness would step in and say, okay, the population that you're trying to get an understanding from would be the entire student population, and we would assist you in doing a random sampling or a stratified uh, uh, type of sampling where you could, depending on the questions that you're asking, um, make sure that we're getting the ad adequate coverage of the types of students um, so that it can be, in this way, I mean, I'm thinking we would have this one be more statistically significant and we would really look to a, a size that we could talk about the confidence at which we're saying our sample represents the population of the entire student body. But I think we're getting, in that case, I think it's a higher level and we're right. really at the program level where people are trying to get information quickly. We're really encouraging you not to worry to make this a rigorous statistical study because you will not have the resources. Our office can't support all of those kinds of studies. But there will be institution level um, surveys that we will conduct and actually in the future we're trying to have a number of questions that you might be able to pull information from specific items that will inform your service unit outcomes. But this is part of the process as an institution as we're collecting the service unit outcomes that you're developing because they've made sense to you. Uh, my office, we're starting to, to look at those and see trends and patterns where we can cluster and come up with something that will work in that way. But for the purposes today and the kind of surveying we're talking about, we're not, we're not um, asking you to even consider that. If you want to be more rigorous or, you know, if you're doing a doctoral dissertation, <laughs> we can, but that's different. Um, Another type, really, another type of sampling, um, it's referred to as um, non-probabilistic, you don't need to know that, but it's kind of <laughs> like um, intercept uh, surveying, if you've been to a mall or you go to Disneyland and they stop passerbys who look friendly, you know, I mean, they're getting input that's useful to them to improve their services. It's not statistically significant, um, but you may, if you do something like that, you may purposefully look to see that you're not just asking all men or all women or one ethnic group. You know, you're kind of building in a, a stratification, a coverage of different types of students. But something like that would be perfectly fine. Again, it's not statistically rigorous. Does it yield valuable information? Probably, you know, and that's what we're after. Yeah, Frank. So basically, if uh, we decide to go with a random, if somebody's office or somewhere is there a website that says, uh, for so many of the population, this is the percentage that is the statistically yeah. valid results. If you're interested in something like that to get something statistically significant, um, and we'll provide information, contact our office because we'll ask you some questions. We're going to want to ask you things like, you know, how important is it, uh, your margin of error? What can you tolerate and still have it be meaningful? But what level of confidence? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't see that as a problem that's not a necessarily. Problem, that's, no, if yeah. it, you guys decide. Yeah, that's right. And you just need to 
you, and so if, if you have 100 students and you guys say, I'm going to take 25, take 25. It's okay. You don't have to drill down that much for outcomes assessment. If you want to, that's fine. And that's why we have the Institutional Effectiveness Office. But what we're saying now for program level surveying, you can figure out what's reasonable to you, what you think, because you know your program better than anybody else. You know the students, you know your volume, you know all of that. And so then you determine what might give you the information. Go through the cycle once, do the survey once, and see if it gives you some information. And if, it, if you're feeling it's not quite right, then up it the next time you try it. And so that's yeah. okay. That's yeah. okay. Present or lower moment. it because maybe it was too much. You bit off more than you can chew or something like that. That's perfectly okay. It really just depends on what you're after. I mean, say, for example, you're looking at, uh, say, your population is all students taking general ed classes, which is similar to the critical thinking assessment that was administered. In that case, we were concerned about getting an adequate or, uh, sample size. It was like what Panna was like 400. Uh, students we actually collected data on, but we have tables where we can say if you want to be 95% confident that this is accurate, this is the number that we suggest given this estimate of the total population. So but you don't have to do that kind of approach. You can just sort of make a number and do a random sample and you'll be fine for outcomes assessment and see, just see what it gives you. And that'll be fine. Okay? Don't do two though. <laughs> I think common sense is the word we're trying to find here. Yes? There, um, there was some talk about using the student voice software. Okay. Sabrina Saunders. Uh, and, and the best practices portion of that where they would just give us samples of that and we could just have them do it for us. Is that still on? No. You know, yeah, I can't. Oh, okay. I, I don't know yeah. if that's going to no. be continued. But we'll, we do have a, um, a subscription to Survey Gizmo, which is uh, similar to that. So it's web-based. Um, and you would just contact institutional effectiveness again. Actually, Daniel Berriman is um, our expert on Survey Gizmo, and we, the institution, has decided to use this um, software. It started out with the distance learning program, by the way. Um, it's ADA compliant, so that's a good thing. Um, but it produces results pretty quickly. It's easy to design. But our office, <coughs> you know, we support you if you're having trouble with that. Um, as far as banks of questions, I'd be a little leery of that. I mean, we, I'm going to provide you with some sample professionally developed surveys. You know, it helps you. But really, focus on, on the questions you want to answer for yourself. So these are your outcomes. And, you, and so you know what you want to find. It's just formatting it all so that you know how to find it. Okay. All right. Um, Collection of, oh, that was just sampling, good grief. Okay. <laughs> collection of data. How are you going to collect the data? These are some things that you need to figure out up front. We're doing all the practical stuff up front. Okay, so, you know, how are you going to do this? There are your options. They're all listed up there. You can look at this. Um, optical, mark, those are, use the number two pencil type that you have there. And you can say, oh, look, survey gizmo. <laughs> right up there. We are finally getting down to all of that. So here again, you need to think about how you, you know, what's the best way to obtain information for your surveys. Think about your audience. Do they have internet access? You know, think about being able to capture as many as possible. I mean, we've often, unfortunately, taxed faculty because you've got a captive audience of students in a classroom, so we're surveying there, but there may be other places where you can get them in person. Or, you know, if it's email, you got to make sure you've got accurate email accounts the best as possible or your response rate is going to be pretty low. And usually for instructional programs, if you're going to do a survey like of, of your majors, and so you have a closer contact with your majors, and so this might be, work, you know, email might work mm -hmm. if you're trying to do your majors because most faculty know the majors in their area. And so that, that might seem reasonable, be a reasonable approach. And then the last bullet item, right up front, professional and financial resources available and needed. Here again, you got to think about that up front, and then that will determine a lot of your answers to your questions. So this is just, you know, you do your pre-planning, and then this is step number one. A lot of thinking up front to make sure that this will work for you. If you get past there, then you're on to step number two, which is the content and the wording of each question that you're going to put in the survey. Some basic guidelines here for you. Um, remember what your purpose is, and then actually look at the questions that you're formulating, and is it appropriate to your purpose? 
Are you asking the questions that will give you the, res the information that you're looking for? So you have to always go back to why am I doing this survey? Is this question helping me get back to the purpose of why I'm doing this, the focus that I need to um, have with this? Eliminate unnecessary questions. A lot of people will say, everybody add questions to the pot, which is great. And they think that if they ask all the questions, they'll get a lot of good information. You won't. You need to edit. You will always need to edit. And then once you edit, you edit some more. And you take some questions out. And you need to be able to do this. Some basic things about unnecessary questions, what we call double barrel questions. You're actually asking two questions in one. And then that will confuse people. You have to keep them simple and keep them singular. Okay. Um, people that have written SLOs, remember I always tell you when you write your SLOs, you make them too big, you put too many verbs in there because they're, you're making them, okay, same thing, alrighty. Um, can they actually answer the question? If you're asking a graduate of the instructional program what happened three years ago when they were in the program because you want to get an alumni's response, they might not remember. As important it is to you, they may not remember, so you have to think. Can they actually answer the question? Is it worded in a way to sway people? And so you're only providing like positive responses and maybe they have a negative response, but you don't give them, you know, so you have to be conscious of the wording that way. Will they actually answer the question? Are you answering two personal questions? Some people don't like to tell you how much money they make or this or that, or I don't know, you know, whatever you're looking for and stuff. So make sure you don't get too personal or public institution, okay? You don't need to drill down that much. Wording, not too vague, not too confusing, not using lingo and jargon from your areas, just basic, simple, clean language that communicates directly. No double negatives, teachers know this, no double negatives, all that. Um, don't use loaded terms for sensitive issues if you're actually doing that. Okay, that makes sense? Everybody okay? I oh. just, uh, one thing to add, um, for appropriate wording, also include, if it makes sense in your question, instructions that will ensure that you're going to get all the information that you need. So in other words, if you want a ranking, specify, please rank your responses using a one, two, three, a four. You know, you really have to spell out exactly what you want them to do in order to get all the information for the <coughs> questions. And we've got some examples to show you what we mean by that as well. Okay. You guys are all right? Everything going okay? Okay, great. Step number three. Okay, now you've made up questions, right? <coughs> now the structure of the response for each question. How do you want them to respond to these questions? You have two broad options here. You have the infamous open-ended and closed-ended, okay? So open-ended, there's not one definite answer, okay? You're allowing them to express themselves um, and answer it in their own words. Downside, time and effort, right? And, and, but you get nice little quotes and you get a lot of fabulous information, but you, somebody's going to have to sit down and read all of those and actually tally all of those and categorize all of these and all of that. So you need to consider that. And if it's really important for you and you're willing to commit the time and the effort, you can throw in some open-ended questions. You know how you do some surveys at the very end, they say anything else? And stuff? Those are open-ended questions. But somebody's going to have to calculate all those comments. And, oh, so factor that all in. Those are considered open-ended. Now, the more direct way to do this is what we call closed-ended. You provide them with a certain, certain responses that they can choose from. And there's a variety of different ways to do that. This is more standardized, that's true. They're not as freewheeling as the open-ended, but it tends to be easier to analyze the information. And we're really gearing up and doing a lot of outcomes assessment at the college now, and so we go back to our keep it simple. I'm not saying you have to do it this way, but we love to keep it simple. So you might want to do that. Um, they are, you must design the choices you know, with all the answers and stuff, and that's going to be the, we're going to show you varieties of those. So there is some pros and cons to this, just like in anything. But you, here again, you need to figure out how you're going to formulate the answers so that you can get the information you want. I keep saying that over and over and over again. Yeah, and um, this isn't in the presentation, but when you're talking about having close-ended with a finite set of answers, this is just a recommendation. What you might want to do is develop <laughs> your finite answers, and if you have the opportunity, and this is really just good practice, it, it will 
go a long ways. Pilot it with a very small group, especially if it's students. You know, you may be missing something that's really relevant to their experience, and you won't know that if you have, you know, you develop your perfect survey in a, you know, just amongst yourselves and you haven't tested it out. You might learn, you might add, you know, two additional sets that you hadn't even thought of, but they're important to students. So it's really worth the time if you can collect a few individuals to pilot it, see if it makes sense, see if you've covered all of the potential options. Okay, so you've made the questions, and now you're trying to figure out, and you've decided you wanted to do close-ended. Okay, there are a variety of ways you can formulate the answer portion of for each of the questions, and these tend to be the most common ways. There's more, but these tend to be the most common ways. And the first one is the Likert scale. Um, how closely does their feelings match a state? You give them a rating scale, and then they choose this one, and it, typically it's from... Uh, agree strongly, strongly, strongly agree. agree overall to strongly disagree. It's one of those with all the little, the little buttons right over there. You can give them a multiple <coughs> choice format. In fact, you're very you know aware of the multiple choice, but you can do a multiple choice format. Pick the best answer, type of thing. Um, ordinal ranking. This is what Eva was talking about, where you ask them to rank something in order. You you can do that. That's uh, a type of response. Categorical. Um, you provide them with categories and then they pick the category that they belong to or something like that. That is an actual close-ended response. And then numerical. Um, they, it's actually a number and they pick a number, one through five or something, that, that gives them their feeling about the information. So these are variations on close-ended. Here are some examples, okay, so that you can see these right now. Liker, so, oh, it didn't turn out right. Sorry. I just visualized the visualize, five. Visualize the five is over here. Oh, it, it worked on my computer. Okay, so the five is over here, and strongly disagree is over here. So you always start with positive, and you go to negative, like that. Okay, so the five is over here, but you can see it's a scare, and, and it's a variation of that. Multiple choice. This is just like a plain old multiple choice test question, what you do, and you have them circle one. You know, choose one in this. The ordinal one is, um, you know, put a one next to them that you most, and then you and then you mark first, second, third, fourth, fifth. You know, and you rank. Uh, you do that. Categorical. We have pictures on here. You can see, and then that one I got from a, a web survey, and then you just click on which sport that they were doing. And then, unfortunately, on here it doesn't show the last one. You have it in your handout, the numerical. How old were you on your last birthday? You give them a, a hardcore number, just a, a distinct number. That's considered numerical responses for all of this. I'm sorry the slide went crazy on us on this. Okay, so those are some samples for the different closed ends. Every okay? Good. Okay. General suggestions about the responses here. I put in the fancy names, but here again, let's talk about it. It's called scale point proliferation. If you go more than five options, you're just annoying people, okay? So you try to keep it five or less with your answer options because then you're getting too fine a distinct. Don't do it, okay? Do that. Order of your categories. Like we said, it's better to go from lower to higher, from positive to negative. Is that it? Um, I don't know, but they usually say, I've seen, most of the time, it's lower to higher. So you start with your lowest number, and you go to your highest number. I think that's intuitive to people just to think that you increase. That you improve. And it just makes them easier to respond to it that way. Um, minor distinctions, so don't do that. Um, the other, okay, I, I've, I've read a lot, and they say don't use other, because it gives you too many, uh, just don't do it. Okay, it, even though you, okay, okay, you can if you want to. <laughs> But it is highly recommended that you don't throw the other option in there because it gives you too much stuff. Does that rank with like all of the above? Yeah, sort of like all of the above. <laughs> yeah. Other, all of the above. I mean, again, it just depends. It depends on the question, but and your others worse than all of the capture. above. But all, yeah. Because here again, with your service unit outcome or your student learning outcome, you're looking for something specific. And if you say all of the above or up, <coughs> you're not getting the information we want for this process. Okay. Another um, option though, I think, if you think about your own experience taking a survey, if you're being asked a question about something that you have not experienced 
and there's no option to respond, it is good to have a, uh, an, an NA, it doesn't apply, because then you're not getting a junk response. You can at least ferret out those cases where they have no experience and have no attitude to really accurately express. So, you know, I always like to include it. That does not apply, because you're not, you know, you're, you're giving somebody an opportunity to respond, and you're not excluding them um, because you've not provided an option that fits their case. Okay, sequence of the questions. This is a, an example of how you can lay the questions out to try to get your biggest bang for your buck. So you always start with your easiest questions first. And this is, teachers know this when we make up <laughs> tests and stuff, because that gets them going, it gets them feeling good about this. They're more apt to finish the survey because they, they don't have to think right off the bat, they can just start doing this. In the middle series, that's where your important questions go, the ones you really want to find out information on, because now they're geared up, they're in survey mindset, and then away they start to go, and then they can really uh, do that. At the end of the survey, if you want demographic information, maybe put it at the end of the survey, okay, and then they can finish it up uh, that way. A lot of times people start with the demographic information because they think that that's easy information and stuff like that, but you might want to try it this way, a little bit differently, close more on the instruction side. And then you always say thank you at the end. Because we want to thank them for their time and their effort and to help us with our outcomes assessment process. Okay. So that's basic for um, your sequences when you lay out a survey, easy way. Then, the, the format, the layout, the appearance, here again we mentioned um, it needs to be clear, well laid out, it needs to look somewhat professional, it's representing your program, it's representing the college. We got a nice little new logo. If you want to throw that on there, I think that would be wise. Um, so just, you know, think about that. Just don't try to throw something together and think people will respond, okay? The other thing is if you decide that you want to be able to scan responses to a survey that you've developed and you want to um, access institutional effectiveness as a resource, Get in touch with us early on so that when we're designing the questions and the layout, we can make sure that the, you know, the position of the bubbles, whatever, works well with the, um, the, the scanning um, software. So Hannah and Daniel could help with that because they're the ones who actually know what works with the, the, the tool itself. But I just recommend that you would get with us early on to help with that. Okie doke. Not a lot of questions. Okay. Okay. After all of this, and you're fabulous, you've got this great information, you've got to know surveys are not going to be perfect. And that's okay. That's perfectly okay. Um, like even, uh, some of these are going over some items that we've already thrown out at you, which is ask for feedback at each step of the process. Um, you might want to ask colleagues and or students, colleagues in your, de in your department and out of your department. They can provide some very helpful feedback in the development process and students pilot early with a, a handful of students just to make sure you're getting the feedback that you're at and you're asking the questions the right way, things like that. That's all called beta test. That's the fancy name for beta, t beta testing is the fancy name for it, okay, and all of that. Um, you need to be patient. It's not going to come out perfect the first nor the second time. And just know that, and that's okay. It's a process. And you'll eventually get there, and, and that will be fine. So just be patient with yourself. Um, some general suggestions on the administration is that if you're doing a paper survey, you might want to do a cover letter to explain the purpose of the survey. That helps people buy into it a little bit more. They will give you more valid responses. Um, things along the instead of just throwing a survey, it's you know anybody who walks in the door, something like that. Um, confidentiality and privacy issues. You, if you're going to do a survey, you must be cognizant of those laws and just good practices that, so no names, no IDs, nothing like that. And even if you're tallying the surveys and, and you're trying to, and you take those items, you know, you can't, you got to white them out. We just don't do it, right? Yeah, Anything I mean, else? It, you know, there are some surveys that are being administered on campus where we are collecting student IDs for the Student Success Initiative, for example. But as Kim says, when we're asking for that information, we're very sensitive. We resist asking that information because we want people to feel comfortable. You want them to, you know, not have to even give it a second thought that information about themselves is, is out there. 
If you're going to ask for that, you have to be really clear to them what you're going to do with that information, how you are going to protect confidentiality. You know, you'll make it really clear that only the research analysts are going to have access to the inf information. Faculty won't know, you know, so it can't influence their grades. If it's for um, employees, you know, supervisors won't know if you're asking. I, mean, I think typically for stu uh, service unit outcomes, you're not really going to want their names unless you're collecting it because you want to have a focus group with uh, volunteers later on. They could volunteer their names and you would tell them why. Just be very clear and straightforward what you're doing with the data. And that's the point. The kind of surveying we're talking about here is really low-level surveying. And, the re and for this you know, program level, for um, SLOs and SEOs, you probably really don't need this kind of information. It's, it's not going to help you get you know, with the questions that you're asking. Um, at more at the institutional level, that might be relevant, and that's where institutional effectiveness comes in to the ball game and all of that, and they got to deal with that kind of stuff. And the other thing is, is that you, if you do paper surveys, you have all these paper surveys, and you have student IDs or employee numbers on, not good, not good at all, because then you're going to have to shred, and you're going to have to store it under lock and key. I mean, it's just all sorts of things, so probably not the best thing. One thing I would um, emphasize about administration of surveys, if, you're, if you have a fairly large sample and say you're going to multiple classes or multiple units or something like that, and you're not the only person doing it, you want to make sure that you're really clear that everybody who's administering the survey is doing it in the same manner, right? So, because otherwise you're going to get inconsistent results that are probably just related to the fact that the same instructions weren't given um, or even the same level of expectation. I mean, if if you go in there and you just sort of pass it out to people and it's not really clear, you're probably going to get bad responses. But if you've got someone who has a clear script that says, here's why we're doing this survey, you know, just briefly, and you know, make sure you answer all these questions. Do you have, look at the thing, do you have any questions? You can clarify it right then and there. Um, and then you, know, you, you show that you care about the answers. You're going to get a very different set of responses than a case where it's just sort of passed out and see you later, I'll come collect them you know, in a day or two. So be sure that if you're asking for the assistance of someone, you've pre prepared them with a clear set of instructions. Okay. So that covers the administration? Okay. Yeah? Yeah? All righty. Everybody's good. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about surveys and this whole outcomes assessment process that the college is engaging in, and that's just going to be a part of the way we do things. The actual creation of the survey is just the beginning of the process. You can see it's pretty extensive, and so you have to commit your time and effort to do that. But now that's just the beginning. You have to consider the back end, which is the analysis, which is that when you talk about outcomes assessment, that's called closing the loop, right? So you have your outcome. The survey is your assessment tool. You sent yourself some criteria, some levels for success. Then you actually do the survey, and but then you've got to analyze it and sit down and talk about it and all of that. And then you're going to have to say, come up with a plan based on the information from the survey. There's a lot of, you know, there's five steps in the outcomes assessment process. So the actual creation of the tool is just the second step in the process. There's all the other parts that you need to finish it all up. So you need to be cognizant of the analysis required. Now. Here again, we sort of touched on this before, statistical or otherwise, we put it all the fancy names down, the different statistical ways you can do this, but honestly, we don't need to really do this at a program level or for the small little surveys that we're doing, absolutely at the institutional level, but that's the Office of Institutional Effectiveness, that's where our experts are, they're the ones doing this. Now, if a department or program wishes to go into statistical analysis, they can ask for the um, expertise of institutional, effect, institutional effectiveness, but they really do not have the personnel to go out and help every single department and every single program. So our recommendation is make a good solid survey based on good practices and do the best you can and there you go. Let's see what it shows. Uh, what statistical analysis package do they have? SPSS or what are they using and do we have access to that at all? Yeah. Ask them. We do, but um, concerning for surveys, typical surveys to use in education, we don't need to, we wouldn't do things like ANOVAs and questions because uh, the, the type of question and the type of response, that determines what type of statistical, statistical analysis you would use. And so most likely we would likely do a frequency or a mean type of a response, and those you can use in software as well. Right, but SPSS would be available then for us um, to use? We're, we only 
we have license, we should have license with matriculation. Yeah, there's yeah, a very yeah, limited number of licenses. So, yeah, there's only a certain number of licenses. You know, if, if you are, again, if this is something that's expanding beyond a couple of departments, say, again, if you're looking at general ed, and I don't know, let's say you want to take the results to a survey, an attitudinal survey, or one that's getting at, um, say, motivational states of students, which a survey would be a good choice to assess that. Say you want to correlate that with success on a student learning outcome. That's where we could do a correlational study, and we, and we could help you with that. I mean, that's a very legitimate kind of application, but again, that's going beyond, um, you know, even just a survey. Here you're relating it to something else, a performance in some other, uh, using some other method. But, you know, basically, as Hannah has said, um, typically for analyzing survey uh, results, you would just be looking at frequencies, bar graphs, and pie charts. And actually, um, we're intending to conduct another work workshop that's for analysis specifically, and we can show you, you know, how to use Excel in a way that's easy um, for those of, of you who would like that kind of assistance. But, yeah, it's beyond the scope of this workshop even. Um, we're back to keep it simple again, so I just want to keep telling you that. <laughs> um, resources, again, confidentiality again, and with outcomes assessment, this bottom bullet I want to draw your attention to, key findings. The point of the outcomes assessment is that once you do the survey, what are your key findings that the survey tells you? And that's the good and the bad, the positive and the negative. What, what are you doing well? What is maybe not going so well and then we need to plan? And that is the key to outcomes assessment. You, you set up your outcomes, you, you figure out this assessment tool that you're going to use, you, you do the assessment, and then when you do your analysis, your point is, what are the key findings that it tells you? And that's really all outcomes assessment is asking for, is key findings, supportable conclusions based on your key findings. That's really all we're looking for, for outcomes assessment. And then you develop a plan based on those key findings. All right, everybody okay? Uh, okay, because everybody's right, so I want to make sure. Okay, now I, I did uh, one slide, sorry, for the SLOs, for the instructional uh, faculty here. Just for the faculty that's in attendance here, um, these are indirect measures. You probably can tend to use this at your program level outcomes, but you need to have other direct measures of student learning at your program level. You can also add this in, but by itself, this is not acceptable for student learning outcomes at the program level. Um, but it is good if, look at the three check marks, that's what it's good for, for the instructional side of the house at the program level what the students believe they're learning, how the, uh, if you want to survey your alumni, or if you want to survey employers to see how our students are doing out in the real world. The surveys work well for those three I, um, items on the instructional side of the house. We're, surveys for the instructional programs tend to look at the quality of the student preparation, either you know the mentor or work experience, this will be good for work experience, classes, um, here again going back out to the employer to see do, were the students prepared appropriately for the jobs that they are going out and doing. So surveys are great for that aspect of that. Uh, closed end questions will give you content knowledge, tend to give you more content knowledge than the qualitative, you know, how do you feel about this and, and all of that. Open-ended is the qualitative um, compared to the closed end. Open-ended can also give you trends and concerns, which might be helpful for your program analysis at the program level. So you might want to think about using a survey if those are important questions for your instructional program. What are the trends? What are the concerns of our program? Tend to be more for the trades and, and those, you know, the, the, uh, the work experience and things like that, that are part of the instructional programs. But surveys can be very helpful in that neck of the woods, okay? But I had to throw something in there on the instructional side of the house because surveys are going to be big for the service side of the house and can be useful in certain situations for the instructional side too. Okay? Yeah? All right. Okay, final thoughts. You can read this. You know what this is. Okay? It's, hopefully you all are recognizing now it's going to take some time and thought and effort up front. 
And so everybody says, oh yeah, we'll just do a survey. Well, oh yeah, we'll just do a survey can be problematic. If you need to know, you need to go in with your eyes open about what it's going to entail and what kind of commitment from the department is going to be needed to actually do a survey. And then if you're okay with that, then do it smartly so you get your biggest bang for your buck. Okay. All righty. Good. You ready? We can do. Uh, okay, hang on one second. One last thing. In your handout, besides the PowerPoint presentation, after you get through that, we gave you a handout with a little bit more information about each step in the process. I know you don't want to hear about it right now, but you can take this back and, and go over it again. And obviously, you can uh, you know call and ask questions if you want to. But trying to give you some. You know, there's some things to think about and help you a little bit more when you're going through this process. Okay, so that's the rest of your handout. Okie doke. Now, you've been sitting there so nicely as students. We want to get you a little bit more involved. So, you're going to give us a survey. We're going to give you. A <laughs> you're good. Exactly. We're going to. We're going to give you survey questions. How about that? <laughs> I believe, 12 questions. And what we want you to do, first take a few minutes and kind of glance through them and maybe make some notes to yourself. But what we want you to do is um, basically critically evaluate based on what you've just learned now. Yeah, because <laughs> you all know. I know, but this will we'll be reinforcing some things. Just take a look at some of the questions. They're not themed or anything. They're just some random types of questions. And just think about, you know, what's wrong with any of these questions, okay? And there may if be there's some, anything. Yeah, and there may be some that you, you really can't find anything, and that's fine. So we just kind of want to give you some practice in being critical. So you checking the student learning. Yeah, if you whip something together and then you want to go through and edit it and make sure that you're following the guidelines that we've just presented, this kind of gives you an opportunity to begin practicing doing that. Is it good? Is it bad? Thumbs up, thumbs down. You said we got some thumbs down, we got some thumbs up. Let's hear some. What do you think? That's problematic. Why do you need to know that? Yeah. I thought we got that clear on the question. Maybe. Also, but you have to be more clear on the definition of household. Does it include the cell? Yeah. Does it not? Percentage the number. Right. It's pretty ambiguous. You can have multiple interpretations of what a household is and who's included in a household, as Hannah yeah. said. Do you count yourself or not? Right. Do you so count you can get a real different sense. Yeah. So something as simple as that, you have to make sure your wording is gives you what the information that you want back. Okie doke. Right. Basically, you're generating apples and to apples instead of, you know, you're going to get apples and oranges mixed in a bunch if you aren't that specific with your wording. Okay, what do you think about question number two? What do you guys think? It's kind of personal? It's nobody's business? Yes, Anna? <laughs> there are lots of things wrong with this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give others a chance. Yeah, so, you, yeah, 5,000, it should be under the choices. If you were going to include yeah. that, it should be one of the choices. That's well, it's not responsible. The whole range. The whole range, Somebody right. could be less right. than 5,000. Right, less than 5,000, right. Especially students around sure. here. Sure. What if you make more? Yeah. You and what if you make more? Sure. We don't provide that option for this one either. Right. And, so, and then if you do throw those options in, then you're up to like seven different levels or something like that. Remember we talked about you don't want to give them more than you know, keep it you know down to a reasonable number and all of that. So you, like Hannah said, there's a lot wrong with well, this. Also, Any other like one? the fifteen thousand. Say that you make fifteen thousand a year. Well. There's, you can check two categories. Yeah, so they're not mutually they're all exclusive, so. Right. Yeah. Right. It should be to like 14. Why would people be honest? Nine, nine. Nine. People might not be honest. It might be too I personal. Because I, <laughs> I don't yeah. that question. So. Right. But basically, the, I guess the principles that we've gotten at, I mean, it's it's sensitive information on the one hand, yes. I mean, if you absolutely, absolutely needed to know that, you could ask it and see what you get. But you've gotten some good things. I mean, on the one hand, you were sensitive to the audience that you're um, administering this to, students, and you kind of have a sense. But you also know you can have a broad range as well, so you've gotten that. 
Hannah's got this business about it. Uh, you don't have mutually exclusive. It's confusing. I mean, what if you make right at 15000 mm -hmm. You could technically be correct in, in checking off more than one. So it's messed up in a bunch of different ways. But good. I mean, you've gotten those. So yeah. there's a problem with it, whether it's, you know, before taxes or... Exactly. Yeah. So. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. That's another one, right? You would want to say an annual right. gross income. Gross Even then, net. some of our students might not be really not clear on what, what that means. Right. Yes. Yeah, so the way you worded it, before taxes. So that's really clear, I think, uh, language for anybody to understand. Excellent. Okay. Number three, what do you think? It's two questions. There you go. Very good. Remember we talked about those double barrel questions, asking two for one, and then they'll not know how to answer it? Very good. You spotted that one. It's also leading into, please rate you, well, I think it, it kind of leads to uh, uh, rate higher, uh, just by the way the second question is, well, and the second question of how it's worded. Um, It, you, mean it means, you mean it leads it to because it says, do you think it will affect the image? So you're making the assumption right. that it is well, going to, and it might lead the well, to answer a certain way. I mean, it's obviously, it says, uh, have, you, have you used, uh, have you, first of all, Oh, no, we're on number three. I'm, I'm sorry, you're right. We're on number three. Right. Okay, you're getting ahead of us. Yeah, two questions. No. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we're on number three. three. That's That's four. Four. Number four is also two questions, that's why I actually... Number four is also two questions, right? Anything else you guys don't like about number four? No. The second what? part, you should say if yes, yeah, that then answer. If yeah. yes, yeah. then it's, right. here again, it's the way you word yeah. 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 format, because you're not getting the information that you need. Absolutely, mm -hmm. very good. Does Bill Barr point that the, these, using the Student Success Center is actually a requirement? So, so if no... Did you fail the class? Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like, would you sure? But you know, Monica, actually, we're faced with that challenge as well. It is required, but just like a lot of homework assignments might be required, it doesn't mean students are doing it. But you want to be sensitive in a way that you're collecting input where students feel comfortable to say, no, I really didn't go, I didn't meet that requirement. But then, you know, you want to you provide non-judgmental um, type of questions that say, if not, why not? Or, and are there other resources that you used, perhaps? So that's a good distinction. At this point, I'm going to just add my two cents on that. I think it's this that, again, that, that open comment or else a separate piece of paper where you can put your name and put comments on for questions um, is the fact that I already have reports of students who are saying to me, what if we don't need this, this extra supplemental? And I think that's something we valid to find out. We don't think it applied to us. We didn't think we needed it. That's, that's part of it. So you have to have something open there as far as I'm concerned. I don't think that you can just do a yes, no. You know, it has, it has and, to that's, and that's the department's choice on when they de develop a survey like that. If that's what you're trying to get at. You really want the student's opinion on something. They, and you're willing to put in the time to, to calculate all of that. Then absolutely add it to it. Yeah. Absolutely. And the satisfaction level could be misconstrued. Are you simply dissatisfied? Because you are required to take exactly. something outside right. of the classroom, this really needs a lot more elaboration. Exactly. No, that's really good to be really clear about what aspect of the student center. Is it the SLA or is it something else? Very good. You know, I want to respond to Fran. Um, Kim and I, we, we have some difference of approaches, but I think it's, I think we're a good balance. So, you know, not having too many others, too many options, I think that really makes your analysis much easier. I totally agree. I'm an anthropologist by training. If I had my choice, I would sit down for an hour and talk to every student I possibly could instead of administer a survey. For me, they're frustrating. I, I feel like I'm being put into a box. But it's a good way to get a, a, a lot of information from a broad sample of people. Okay, so I always put other. Granted, it makes more work for me. I love quotes. I think it's a sensibility of the language of students, that kind of thing. But, you know, again, it's more for me to deal with. But again, as you've said, um, there may be, you may have a sense that there's a whole experience that you're not tapping into and you want to provide that opportunity for students to be able to say that and then you can do that. But again, it's a matter of choice and preference and style and the purpose of your survey. Yeah, just to add to Eva, sometimes we administer focus groups with like experienced students because we 
students. Students experience certain things, but we might leave some of those options out. And so we focus group them to get a sense. And then from that, it might come out that some students feel that they don't need it. And that's why we would put that option in there as a response. So it'll be more focused yeah. that way. Right. But that's also time consuming. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And to be honest, the others are okay because not too many people fill it out. I'm just saying. But if they do, yeah, you do have it's to It's choices. It. It's choices. <laughs> yeah. You need to know your choices so you can make the survey the best you can for your neck of the woods. Absolutely. I have a general question about surveys. I tend to be an uncooperative survey taker. <laughs> that survey fatigue that you have you mentioned earlier. How do you factor this in? Because I think results can be terribly skewed mm -hmm. by people simply either not caring mm -hmm. or not liking it because of the fatigue. So how is this factored in to results? You know, for the instruct, I'll, I'll jump in. Sure. For the instructional side of the house, if you are surveying students, I really believe it's the tone that's set by the instructor when they give the survey, and it's laying the groundwork to make sure they understand the importance that people are really, the, you know, the depart. This is to help the department and to help future students. So we can make things better. So you got to lay the groundwork about that it's going to be taken seriously. People are going to look at it and they're going to value the input. And instructors, by the very nature, have an authority figure. Let's hope with the students, and that they can then stress the import of the survey. And we're not asking everybody to do this. We're just asking you because we really want to know what you think about this program. And, I, and so for the instructional side of the house, when you're surveying students, I think we have an opportunity to let them know we really care about what they think and we really want to know their opinions. And if you lay the groundwork, you might get a, a, a better response that you can trust. But that isn't my question. I agree, I agree that with, that's how you present it to students. That still doesn't overcome that idea that there are those who will not cooperate. And you always have fact. some that won't yeah. cooperate, but the right. better you question. present it, the higher probability that you're going to get somebody well, that will I say, know. okay, do that. But you know, but you know, Bill, you always got the 10% of yeah, your but students. Yeah, you're talking you know? to a lot of professional instructors. I think most of us understand that about presenting this. But my concern is something else. What happens to the student who is not doing well in the class? Right, and takes the survey. And you suspect that there's going to be some sort of, I mean, it's a negative, for it's example, not. For example, I'm known as a rigorous trader in the department. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I have very positive responses from students, so I'm not concerned about that. But there are students who are going to be upset when they know they're getting a D, and they take a, and they take a survey. So how, my question is, is a general question. How does this affect the outcome of surveys, and how is that factored in? when we take a survey, when we look at results, is there any consideration given to that? Well, since you are going to be doing the analysis, you will need to take that into consideration. And this goes back to Fran's question about the volume. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you don't want to do, survey such a small number that this, that, that natural tendency, because you know you're going to have the, that kind of, you know, input from that segment, that it will skew it. So you want to make sure that your volume is is enough that you get a fair read and all of that, and that it's balanced because that's what we're trying to do is balance. Right. But at the at the at the program level for the instructional programs, like we said, we're for outcomes assessment. We're just trying to get information. So you want to survey enough, but not too much. And if you've never done it before, it's you sort of got to try it out and see if it was enough or not. And and you can see. I would think, if you know the type of students that are going through your program, if you're getting a skewed response or not. And honestly, at this point, it's just gut response right now. And, and so that's where you have to sit down and talk to your faculty. Because some faculty may feel that it's a valid response, and others may not. And so then this is part of the analysis, that you guys just sit down and talk about it. That's really all you have to do. Isn't there a built-in factor that you know that you're going to survey, that you're going to be all 1%, 2%? I mean, is there something? That, well, if you're going to do statistical analysis, yes, there is. But you can. I mean, and, you're, and you can expect there's going to be some cases where a student meant to mark something and marked another 
the bubble next to it. But you know, Bill, hey, um, when I've had, when I can, you can tell when you're going through your uh, responses, and you can see, say, a student marked all the same answers because they're being defiant and lazy, mm -hmm. and they're just telling you, ah, here, you know, throw it out. So you just throw those out. You could sure. sure. be judicious about that, and but um, and document that that it was clearly not a genuine, authentic response, and just take it out because it will, def you know, just take it out. Like say you issue just a hundred surveys and you get eighty back or sixty back versus ninety back. That, yeah, that I mean, obviously, if your response rate is low, if your sample size is low, the less reliable it is as a representation of the entire population of people that you care about. But again, it's just to be mindful. Of, can you do all that you can? The types of surveys that Kim listed up there. Mailing surveys, typically you get a very low response rate. Addresses are, tend to be incorrect. They get lost in the pile of junk mail. So you would just say, you know, say if you want a sample of a hundred.